Welcome, everyone. It's a great pleasure this evening to be hosting the seventh annual Kenneth Frampton Endowed Lecture, which was established on the occasion of one of Ken's birthdays. I won't say which one. <laughs> and, and which we look forward with anticipation and a sense of optimism every year at this time of the semester. This optimism is not a coincidence, and in the times we are living in comes as much needed breath of fresh air, but also reaches us somehow in the form of infectious energy, endless curiosity, sustained engagement, critical sharpness, depth of knowledge, and most importantly even, the kind of humor that lifts everyone in its path. I think you, you will all have recognized the very special and unique qualities that make Ken Frampton not only one of a kind, but also so important to our school and beyond. We're really thrilled to be able to honor him again this evening. This year, I wanted to highlight just a couple of ways the school has had the pleasure to engage with Ken's writings and revisit his pedagogy. First, with the publishing by Columbia Books on Architecture and the City of Wright's Writings, Reflections on Culture and Politics on the Occasion of Frank Lloyd Wright at 150, Unpacking the Archive Exhibition at MoMA, and the Living in America, Frank Lloyd Wright, Harlem, and Modern Housing Exhibition at the Wallach Gallery. At second, with the Modeling History Exhibit at Ross Gallery, which included photos taken by James Ewing, of the models also in the show of significant 20th century buildings, which were made by students as part of Ken's history of architectural tectonics, which he taught here for many years. Elsewhere, Ken's pedagogical methods were also on display this year with the exhibition Educating Architects, Four Courses by Kenneth Frampton, which recently closed at the Canadian Center for Architecture where Ken's archive was acquired. Kenneth is the Ware Professor of Architecture here at GSAP and has taught at the school since 1972. And his writings have shaped the minds of innumerable architects. This shaping is celebrated tonight as part of the series which has brought to us in the past a rich dialogue on modern architecture with lectures by Eduardo Suto de Moura, Yvonne Farrell and Shelley McNamara, Angelo Bucci and Bijo Jane. And so we're so pleased um, to have Raul Merotra to add to our kind of guests, our uh, honored guests this evening, and to share his thinking and work with us. But before welcoming Raoul, please join me in inviting uh, Kenneth Frampton to introduce him. Welcome. Um, good evening. I'm very happy you all here, and uh, I'm very happy that Raoul Marotra is here, which was, um, he has had a, a passing kind of, uh, uh, you could say, tropical um, um, affliction, in, uh, and um, has sort of more or less recovered enough to give this lecture, I'm very happy to say. Uh, it's a little embarrassing, to say the least, to um, not to say pathologically solipsistic to be part of an endowed lecture series bearing one's own name. And, um, you know, it's, it's sort of time I definitely moved on, I think, in order to get over this um, problem. But um, I also I take this opportunity to, to remind the dean that I'm still teaching tectonics because I don't have too many other ideas. Um, uh, 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 yeah, too, too, too many other games at my disposal. Um, it's a really a great honor to uh, introduce Raoul Maratra, whose uh, extraordinary uh, achievements, both as an architect and as a public intellectual, uh, make him an exemplary uh, figure in, the, in this profession. And it is a very broad profession because in his case it includes both architecture and urban design. And um, uh, he is, of course, professor of urban design at GSD, he was at some point a chairman of that department. He divides his time uh, between, really, uh, Cambridge, the GSD, and Mumbai, and, uh, and uh, both benefits but also suffers from the, is a victim of globalization in as much as he constantly is passing from one to the other, which is 
uh, taxing on even someone of his stature and, and absolutely extraordinary energy. And um, he was uh, uh, educated in, uh, first as an architect in the, the SEP school in Ahmedabad, which is the school uh, founded by Doshi, and uh, which, uh, by the way, as a building is now under a certain threat. And um, he then also studied, taught at the University of Michigan, studied at MIT, and is now, of course, as I've already said, a member of the faculty, senior member of the faculty in the Graduate School of Design at Harvard. But the, it's very unusual, I think, for someone to have um, this kind of dimension of, um, of a public intellectual and at the same time be an extremely talented architect and also, as if that weren't enough, uh, someone who has um, manifested um, um, you know, a very wide scholarship, has produced uh, innumerable books and also both directly but also as an editor and also has curated many exhibitions of course, always more or less on the same topic, urbanism, and uh, urbanism in relation to um, current, uh, um, yes, we can say, escalated development. And um, I think that uh, he, he's going to talk tonight about the landscape of democracy and, um, and show, uh, well, in fact, play out these two sides, I think, uh, during the course of the evening, uh, both uh, yes, a public discourse and, you know, a uh, capacity to create buildings of amazing stature. I give you Raul Maratra. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for this honor to deliver the Frampton Lecture. And uh, it's great to be here. Columbia is always a wonderful place to speak at. Uh, I've known Ken Frampton since 1998 when I started working with him on this amazing volume of books, just a shot off my shelf, so you know the stuff I like. Uh, and uh, this was an amazing project. I think I was involved in volume eight, which focused on South Asia. Uh, and these sort of marked the canonical works of 100 years. The last century uh, was sort of sponsored by the Architectural Association of China. It was an amazing two or three year project. And uh, so of course one has sort of known him since then, but his seminal work much longer and in many ways have been the foundation of the values I think I've explored as a practitioner. And I do hope Ken will recognize his contribution in the manner in which I've imagined practice and also in the articulation of my architectural responses uh, that I'm going to show you in this lecture. And so this is my tribute to, to his mind-blowing contribution to the field more generally. I'm going to share with you um, some of what this relationship I have with my city, city of Mumbai, how it's come to influence me, how it's begun to inform what I've sort of been doing as an architect in India. Uh, and the kind of engagements that we've sort of been involved with is a kind of triangulation between the practice of architecture, urban design, conservation, and interest in landscape architecture. I've organized this talk really in two sections. The first is I'll share with you um, uh, issues that have been central at least to the questions I've been asking and my imagination as an architect and that I continue to struggle with. So these are by no means definitive answers, but rather questions. And largely the struggle with, an, with the idea of how one can articulate those issues to make productive, uh, as issues make them productive for designers, because often there's a kind of gap there. And then the second will focus on a series of projects that I'll describe and share with you in terms of their design logic and materiality, and I'm sure you'd make the connection. And these issues that I'm going to share with you could be lectures in themselves, so please bear with me uh, as I sort of flip through them. Uh, but I'm sort of trying to be inspired by them from the perspective of design, its instrumentality, and what these could potentially mean for us as folks that intervene in the space of cities and these broader landscapes. Uh, I think equity and social justice is perhaps the most important issue, I believe, in the coming years for an entire generation that's going to practice, but a lot of us who are practicing. Because besides the disruptions that globalization has caused, it is a drive of capital that we know has been detrimental in some ways to the kind of value 
values we have brought to bear on our environments. I've spoken at length about the architecture of what I call impatient capital, because capital is inherently impatient and finds its patience when it resides in foundations and institutes and universities, but that also makes it an architecture that's that drives us towards a vendor-driven autonomous object. And to my mind, uh, it's clear that this free-running capitalism will never help resolve this inherent contradiction about our aspirations to create, whether green buildings, socially inclined architecture, human environments, while as architects simultaneously that we pander to capital and, its, and the forms that they, it naturally demands. As um, Wolfgang Streich has said in his book title, How Capitalism Fails, says, to quote him, capitalism can no longer turn private vice into public benefit. Its existence as a self-reproducing, sustainable, predictable, and legitimate social order has ended. Capitalism has become more capitalist than good for it, unquote. Or oh, even in the words of Karl Marx that resonate, who said to start with about capitalism and to quote him, has capitalism has conjured up such gigantic images of means of production and of exchange that it's like a saucer who is no longer able to control the powers of the netherworld whom he has called up by his spell. And even in Mumbai, we haven't been spared uh, by this gold-plated, gilded uh, Trump tower. Uh, spatial inequity is critical, and as Charles Correa, the Indian architect, wrote, today, to quote him, today the amount of urban space one controls is directly proportionate to one's status or income. It has no connection to actual family size. In fact, poorer people most often have larger families. This space differential, therefore, cannot be justified in human terms and only economic ones. In Australia, in urban areas till at least the 1980s, something I verified a few months ago in Sydney, Every family could have no more than a quarter acre. Australia was locked into spatial equality and thus clearly a society as we know that detests elitism. But equity is not a quantitative measure alone. It has subjective dimensions of access. Sometimes perceived access or an illusion of equity perhaps is productive. Plot divisions that to the very fabric of a city is a great contributor to this, and by extension, architecture. This is what I think designers can pl play a role in defining. Martha Chen, who works on informal economy at the Kennedy School of Government, advocates in the context of economy, and to quote her, what is needed most fundamentally is a new economic paradigm, a model of hybrid economy that embraces the traditional and the modern, the small scale and the big scale, the informal and the formal. What, it ne what is needed is an economic model that allows the smallest units and the least powerful workers to operate alongside the largest units and most powerful economic players, and this is a project that I'll share with you in more detail uh, as we go on. And by extension, I think this discussion leads us into the question of sustainability, something I believe we use very loosely, because this comes down to a chemical or a mechanical fix for any problem perpetuated and driven which is now being driven by an entire green industry. The crit crucial questions that are absent and have to do with spatial arrangements, I believe, is how do you make space a social condenser, an armature to foster and facilitate social connections, not hard thresholds that separate. So here the human dimension, at least in my observations, is totally absent and that's really frightening. In addition, pluralism, which is another issue, the issue of pluralism and coexistence, of form, its coexistence, are inevitable in a democracy, uh, as are collisions between differing forms of urbanism in close adjacencies. Thus, dissipating these polarities and softening thresholds between these disparate forms of urbanism are the essential design challenge, I believe, in the coming years. Facilitating the connection and networks between diverse forms is one way to promote these synergistic dependencies. The questions that naturally as a designer come to mind, can borders be deconstructed and softened? Can boundaries be, be dissipated social, spatially? Could this become the basis for a rational discussion about coexistence? Or is the resulting urbanism that surrounds us, especially in places like Mumbai, inherently paradoxical? Is the coexistence of these differences, differ differing forms of urbanism and their respective configurations of 
uh, and, their, and their respective states of physical utopia and dystopia inevitable? Can spatial configurations of how this, is, this simultaneity occurs be formally imagined? Or is it just inevitable that cities will be modeled or molded in a singular image where architecture is the sole and remarkable spectacle of the city? So these are sort of the kind of questions that um, one grapples with in the everyday of practice. And I think what I have so far described is the sphere of our concerns. How do we make a productive overlap between these spheres of our concern and the spheres of our direct or indirect influence as practitioners? As architects, we are aware and concerned with many issues, from the societal to the planetary scales and ranging from poverty and public health to urban violence and climate change, more often than not, our sphere of influence does not empower us to address any of these issues in a tangible manner. Across the design professions, the frustration tied to our attempts to engage with these problems are palpable. Entire disciplinary practices are in the danger of dissipating because they can't move beyond expressing and representing these concerns. So how do we intersect them with that of, our, of, of influence? Most importantly, I think these narratives illuminate the narrow sort of influence or circumscription of the architect's territory of operation in the business as usual model, usual model of practice. It also sheds light on ways to better understand the site as mediated through the embedded and embedded within a larger scale of economic, social, and political processes. Through this broader scope, designers can potentially, I believe, have a far more reaching and progressive show, social impact beyond the immediate sites of our projects. And so, for us, the city and understanding and engaging with these issues has been critical and actually a generator of our practice. Understanding these narratives, or to borrow the words of my colleague Neil Brenner, uh, to understand the context of the context. We understand the context as something that we can physically understand in tangible ways and excavate climate, material, uh, and with a slightly deeper excavation, cultures of a place. But this is always nestled in another context, which is sort of the geopolitical context. Uh, and trying to create these intersections is, I think, where uh, the most productive questions will kind of nourish uh, uh, our practices. And so, for us, the question really is also, what is the architecture of practice? I mean, the practice of architecture we speak about, and I think this is what Ken was sort of alluding to, because for us, uh, advocacy is one sort of aspect of what we do, but I think we're very mindful, if I may say so, in constructing the instruments uh, for this advocacy, because often we do one or the other, but how do you combine them in productive ways, I think is a very big question for us. And so books become, books, catalogs, pamphlets, manuals, other forms of research publication become instruments of advocacy for us when engaging with these sort of complex projects and problems. Uh, and it becomes also a way of creating partnerships, collaborations, friendships, which serve to keep the conversation on issues and engagement to work with a particular site alive. <laughs> Similarly, then, the publications we hope go out into the world beyond, and these projects have their own life, uh, and they, I, I hope, expand the sphere of our influence. Because finally, if we don't have agency or find ways to have agencies, actually the profession breaks down, and I think this becomes a critical question. So these books that I'm, so there are a number of them. This is a family of books on Mumbai, which went all the way from walking tours to more serious sort of documentation of the history, different aspects of its infrastructure. And these have outcomes. This led to uh, the first urban conservation legislation in India as a result of a kind of critical mass that built up through many such engagements with many such people and collaborations, which I think were triggered off in part by some of these research projects. Uh, and of course, they find their way also in advocacy. So here we worked as advocates for a whole decade trying to organize citizens groups on the ground uh, to preserve areas, uh, to recycle buildings, to generate new economies for these places. It also led us to uh, looking here, the Prince of Wales Museum, a very particular precinct in the center of this historic district. Uh, it would engage with architecture, contemporary interventions which were reversible, but were transitional in what they were trying to do uh, to the problem that exists. In this case, a visitor center, which became a gateway, um, which housed security and many other things. At the other end of the spectrum, we're also interested in kind of urban issues. 
And as Kick and Ken was sort of describing, this was a massive project which was across Harvard University that documented an ephemeral mega city uh, called the Kummela, uh, involved seven schools and landed up in this publication. And then as advocacy also extended itself into the Venice Biennale as an installation uh, to talk about these incredible landscapes which have become a reality in our world, all the way from refugee camps to places for celebration or mil the military. Uh, and and this has resulted in a very recent book called Does Permanence Matter? And this maps about 300 cases of ephemeral landscapes such as this with, with you know, three, four, 500 million people on this planet spending their daily lives here. And Andreas Lepic took this and has now uh, converted this into an exhibition uh, at the Munich um, Gallery because in the conversations in Germany, this is something that resonates very deeply. And so it's a three, no, it's a five month long exhibition with many conversations around it uh, and very beautiful installation. These are carpets that were made locally there uh, which actually have maps of these ephemeral settlements that you can uh, look at and sit around. And, and we've also digitized things like say Burning Man and all of these settlements we've digitized so you can Begin, begin to pull the metrics into the planning discourse. So we can actually measure densities and we can measure distances. You can create metrics uh, to understand these. And this is extended now into a broader project which is looking at urban India. And uh, in the present sort of official calculus of the government, India has something like 7,200 and something towns. And we're making an argument that there are actually 32,000 settlements. Uh, and it's a con condition of flux because the argument we're building in the research is India is 60% urban for six months of the year and 40% urban for the other six months. So the flux of 350 million people, how do you deal with in terms of design? It has huge implications of housing, for example, and rent markets even in the big cities because you have a seasonal change that is mind-boggling uh, and these are so we should in India not be talking about smart cities we should be talking about smart agents because it's these 350 million people that go between the rural and urban or this blur we can't even use those binaries any longer that are making the biggest transformations in the landscape and the c culture of these sort of uh, settlements but looping back to architecture which is what I'll stick with I just wanted to use that as an introduction to talk about my spheres of concern as I come to my spheres of influence, I hope. So from Ken's book, we, the book I worked with Ken on, uh, a decade later, uh, we made this book on architecture in India since 1990 when we liberalized our economy because we began to see very particular patterns that were emerging. This became at the National Gallery of Modern Art, a major exhibition two years ago, uh, which mapped architecture in India since 1947. Many, many interesting things came out of it in my own learning. What you see in this, I mean, besides capturing the seminal publications and things, Again, this was a book that Ken did the foreword for. Uh, you know, at Independence, we had one school of architecture, which is this yellow line. And at uh, uh, two years ago, we had 480 schools of architecture. Uh, it's an amazingly mind-blowing sort of trajectory. And what you see in blue, from 1990, when we liberalized our economy, real estate became a more form formalized sector. And you see the growth of schools sort of related to the growth of real estate. Actually, the demand of architects is inversely proportioned to the growth of real estate because real estate when it becomes an organized sector it's large developers building large gated communities using one architect one landscape architect for multiple projects so 600 homes get built by an in-house architect often and so uh, in another paradigm it would be a completely different economy as far as the profession goes so we shouldn't be having more schools of architecture in fact less so there were many things like this which had to do with criticism documentation education how many PhDs we have I mean there's a very intense documentation of the state of architecture. But one of the things it taught me was, and you know, I'm sort of leading into our projects because these are learnings that loop back, is that there was a variety of protocols and processes uh, through this diverse country uh, which needed to be looked at. And it also taught me that 90% of the architects in the country, which we didn't include in the exhibition and created a huge controversy because all our friends were left out of the exhibition because we said no single family homes. And by just doing that, we eliminated 90% of the best known architects in the country. And you know, it was like you really made good way to make enemies. Uh, and so we found that 
this is 1%. Uh, it, it's just amazing that architects aren't involved in the public realm for various reasons. And so on the other end, you have advocacy, practice with NGOs, uh, self-initiated projects, research, alternate practices, which there is some critical mass that's building. Uh, and because the money is there, the issues, uh, these are issues that occur outside the main city, so it sort of engages another body of professionals and people. But really, the big transformation in the mainstream either involves architects from outside India uh, or it involves, like I said, in big firms, in-house architects. It doesn't really come out to the profession in the way that it recycles ideas or it nourishes uh, the built environment with these ideas. And this mainstream is, I think, where one can actually make the shift. And I think this is true for any part of the world. And in India, it's institutions, corporates, the developers, government, and faith-based. This is massive. The biggest projects, this is what I covered in that book on architecture in India since 1990, the biggest projects happening in, in India today are the faith-based practices, which are 10 times, I mean, you know, I mean, they're building temples which have congregation areas of 30,000 people. Uh, the biggest convention halls in India are 2,000 people. So the scale is mind-bogglingly different. Uh, so when we imagine global capital transforming the environment with these investments, we are totally off because the faith-based practices are building universities. They have, they engage ancient imagery, but they have really modern aspirations. And this is an incredible dichotomy that we are grappling with. Uh, and so recognizing this was sort of important as um, part of this exhibition. The other thing this taught me in looking at forms of patronage is that you have to nuance. When we say client, uh, actually, and I'm sure, again, this might resonate in other parts of the world, but in India especially, we have patron clients, we have operational clients, and we have user clients. And the projects I'm going to show you is how uh, you work across these various scales. So therefore, as an architect and as an advocate of the project, you've got to negotiate these forces completely differently, which is very interesting in my view. So patrons, clients, and users, I'm just going to use that for short, but they're all clients of different kinds. In a weekend house, for example, these collapse into one entity. It's one person who's a patron, who's a client, who's the operational person. And these become, these are, of course, a lot of our work, a lot of our beginning work uh, was to do with this. Even now, we continue doing weekend homes. This is the metropolitan region of Mumbai here. They collapse into one. Um, so this is a house we did about three years ago, you know, a lot of these get built near villages, so they begin to colonize villages, but they become humongous uh, in their expression. And so how do you fragment it? How do you make it more integrative uh, in terms of design? And so here we set ourselves a challenge that even a weekend house, this is for a very well-known doctor who, could, who wanted a villa, but we've disaggregated it because we felt that it should also work for a middle-class person who might be able to just build one room out of this earlier. So this is a living dining kitchen. This is a lap pool with a doctor's study, a guest room, and three bedrooms for the family, which can be closed off to become one large room. But it's also incremental in what it suggests as a configuration. So it becomes also as a paradigm perhaps relevant for the growing middle class. But also it, the disaggregation allows it to sit in this landscape, in the rural landscape, uh, more lightly, uh, rather than the kind of neoclassical villas that are being built, or even in terms of materiality, a simplicity uh, which is not, doesn't polarize uh, sort of what's around it. Uh, and so the scale becomes an important issue uh, as you approach the house. It's a series of courtyards with very simple materials. Uh, the, that, that's, so, that's what sort of the configuration is. Uh, the pool is very discreet. This would normally be out there. But again, that's a form of polarization where you have these sort of hedonistic engagements while gardeners are toiling in the lawns and mowing the lawns, etc. So again, how do you make all this discreet but yet create a kind of ambience and an atmosphere uh, that sophisticated urban people might enjoy in a rural landscape? And these are the three bedrooms that can become one large room designed for the monsoon condition in the way it collects water, opens out to the landscape in terms of its sort of detail here. We've just emphasized the protection for the window to, to counter weathering, which is an important issue for us in these contexts um, using materials. And there's sort of, he didn't want art, so we've got these colored glass which sort of register the sun as it moves around the house in ways it throws shadows uh, and these sort of courtyards that relate to the outside. In larger conservation projects, which is also an interest, this is the Chaumala Palace in Hyderabad. That's the Char Minar, for those who might know Hyderabad. Uh, uh, again, here, uh, it was complicated because the patron was the Nizam's family who wanted to resurrect the 
palace. The clients were the state tourism, uh, others who wanted to sort of bring this as part of the economy, and the users were the citizens of this dense part of Hyderabad. And why it was a contested project was this is the inner city, that's the Char Minar, and what you see in red was encroached upon illegally. So this involved lawyers, it involved stabilizing the edges of it, it involved violence sometimes because people felt they were being threatened. Of course, we didn't get rid of anyone living there, we just stabilized the core to create a large public space, and posing it as a public space changed the narrative. And this is a state we found it in, the usual measure drawings and mapping. I think we had about 120 measure drawings like this with condition reports and all of that. And then, of course, here, you know, even the operational client breaks down because you work with general contractors, you work with craftsmen who can work with lime. That column takes three months to build. It brings a different imagination of time uh, in the way you engage with these processes uh, and understanding uh, these kinds of places. And this is the main Darbar Hall. That entire ceiling you see was reconstructed from scratch because it had collapsed, the chandeliers. It had many components. So even the craftspeople here, it's such a wide range that you can't see it as the entity of the contractor. You you're negotiating with about 12 or 15 people. It's become a museum on the legacy of the Nizam's family. Uh, it had a very low budget, so it's not highly air conditioned, and you know, it's sort of quite casually, informally sort of articulated as display. In institutional buildings, there's kind of another sort of dynamic that happens. And here I want to share with you uh, the, the, the architecture school in Ahmedabad, which Ken ma mentioned. And, and uh, I just want to dissipate that. It's not under threat. This is a campaign that, well, there's a lot of politics involved there because there's a change in management and uh, it sort of triggered off a whole discussion. But I'm glad it did because it makes us aware of this. This is a building designed by Doshi. I studied here. It's a beautiful building. It's a beautiful campus. And we were invited to do the first building, which is a not, not a Doshi building. And so that itself was very controversial. Uh, and uh, But anyway, we engaged with it. That's what the campus looks like. And the Ma these are the build this is the image I showed you, but these are buildings designed by Doshi in the first phase, which are incredibly beautiful. And then there were a number of buildings added as different donors came about, and the, the rest of the campus is really quite chaotic uh, and uh, incrementally sort of uh, developed. And the site we were given was a pivotal site, uh, and we basically, these were all buildings that existed. So we were given the site, and the program required a six-story building by the master planners, and that was like unbelievable to imagine, but we had to fulfill uh, that requirement. Uh, and so we, we created coherence in the plaza, so we've paved it. This is a new cafeteria and a student facility that's been added, again, to give coherence to the core and create relationships uh, across. So like this building also begins to define this plaza, which are other schools that are quite disparate in terms of building. So it's like a pivotal building. But in a case like this, it was, you know, the, the patron was, the Ahmedabad Education Society, which has a wonderful tradition because they were patrons to buildings by Charles Correa, Doshi, even Louis Kahn and Corbusier. So very enlightened people we could sort of go to when we needed it. The client and the operational client was a president uh, of the university who also happens to be an Aga Khan award winner, Dr. Patel. So, and then we had users, which are the faculty and the students. And that was like the difficult group to deal with naturally because you know, in an architecture school, everyone and his uncle have an opinion about what should be done. So it meant a huge amount of presentations which went up on YouTube. You had alum from around the world calling me and writing. And, but it was a wonderful process of transparency. They were all up on YouTube. You can yet see them. Uh, and we sort of, we, this was the footprint we were given. So within that, we had to accommodate what would have been a six-story building. And naturally, for us, it was an intervention in a modern historic a context and one that I'd studied with and learned so much from. So the first decision was, we're not going to go one inch above any of Doshi's buildings. In fact, stay a few inches below just as a sign of respect. And so it meant actually trying to come up with a building that went three floors below the ground. Uh, and that was a challenge, but made a lot of sense in the context of Ahmedabad because it's a very hot climate, the stepped wells, and just going down there, the geothermal advantage is so great uh, that once we could get it past uh, uh, the clients, uh, it really was the right thing, I believe, to do. And 
and this was a model I presented. You know, I had the other half of it closed here, and I went to them. I didn't tell them we were doing this. I just went to the model that was only three floors above the ground. They said impossible to fit the requirements, and then I waited for this discussion to heat up, and then I removed the other half, and they saw the building, and there was like silence for 10 or 15 minutes, uh, and then they finally slowly got used to the idea because it's a challenge technically uh, to do it. But I think that made a big difference. So what I'll share with you is what the building feels like. Uh, that's the stuff around, uh, below ground. What's above ground is very light. It's the reading rooms. On the ground floor is the reception, rooms for juries and student meetings. And then there's a core within the three buildings. One is the skin. One is this sort of thing that you know, encloses the core, which is like four floors of book stacks. And then one floor, which is just the archives. Uh, but the book stack is like a central thing. Which ha and each section of the building has its own logic in terms of floor heights and things. So you get a, a, a very rich sectional kind of quality. And so that's what it sort of feels like. There are a series of courtyards that take light all the way down. And I'll just show you some images of that in section. The light comes right down. There's skylights, which bring it down here. This is archive, so there's no natural light there. And this is the book stack, which sort of you know, is like a central bit uh, in the in the building and along the edge in these courtyards are carols where you have a lot of good light uh, to read. So these, sorry, uh, these are the these are the carols uh, where students and PhD students can sit. And this is separated so you enter it through a series of bridges. So this is a building that sits with the courtyard separating it and a whole skin uh, that goes around it. And so that's what it sort of looks like. Uh, these are movable fins uh, and a very deep base uh, wall. Uh, these become totally transparent. They're operated. There's a catwalk from the inside. Uh, and you can adjust it. And now they're going to use the building. That was one of the brief. How can students learn from the building? And how can one use newer materials? Because though these buildings are in brick and concrete, which was the buildings of a time, and they're very beautiful and robust. But the idea was also students to they confront glass and gypboard and you know, all, a whole range of new materials in liberalized India. And so how do you also demonstrate to them uh, a, a, a use and an articulation of those materials uh, which might inspire them in different ways? And in fact, now one course at the uh, university is going to be on this building where climate is going to be taught through this building with students mapping it. And we are developing a manual with the faculty for how the building will be operated, the louver set twice a day for different weeks of the year, depending on projections of climate, sun movement, et cetera. So it'll really become a living building. Uh, and also as part of bringing coherence to the campus, we added little pavilions, consolidated plazas and squares, uh, which wasn't there earlier. Uh, and scale was, of course, very important. But the materiality was also important in the way uh, we kind of didn't replicate this, uh, but as you'll see, tried to capture uh, many aspects uh, in terms of proportion Proportions. So, for example, these proportions actually reflect those proportions, uh, but in a kind of different and more nuanced uh, way. So, as you enter the building through the bridge, uh, you get a sense of the courtyard below. Uh, this is already minus four meters. As you go below the ground, the concrete gets lighter so that it gets more luminous. Uh, and this is four meters, and then you go down to eight meters. These are common areas for juries and uh, meetings. It's totally on axis with Doshi's buildings, so it kind of embraces and reinforces reinforces that axis so that the plaza begins to get a sense of centrality and become the core uh, of the place. This is the common area which students use for workshops and exhibitions, uh, which is just open, non-air conditioned. The air goes through. It's well shaded. Uh, that's the kind of sense you see as you walk around the building because it's central. Uh, you have these openings, and you get glimpses of the inside. And then as you go below the building, you have a different logic of just eight feet or 2.4 meter heights, which is the book core, uh, which is, I'm now going to show you that core. Uh, and these are the carrels, which open out in these courtyards, uh, which also, these are going to be furnished with ferro-cement uh, design furniture, which is being designed by students and things. Uh, these are the carrels and the book stacks. Uh, these become places people who want to speak step out so that you don't disturb the library. So and it's very cool, protected from the rain. It has sun in the winter. So these are wonderful places climatically uh, to, to, to sit in. You're always aware of the different levels. So you're now at a level which is uh, uh, minus 
you know, half for its two, two, two meters or something. So you look down to that level, you get a sense of the level up above. And these are all these mid um, mezzanines. I love this image because obviously it's a comfortable place. Uh, lots of students sleep there. Uh, and these are the kind of book stacks within that central stack uh, where you see you're, you're, the sectionally you're simultaneously aware of at least three levels. So you're simultaneously aware of about a 12 meter difference, but broken into slabs sectionally, so there's a sense of intimacy uh, without uh, different zones being disturbed. And what you see here is at minus eight meters uh, below the ground. And here you get a sense of all the mid-levels, the courtyard level up there, up there, that's the lowest level. Uh, so this, these sections sort of work, and they're you know, tables and little rooms. Uh, so there's a lot of intimacy. The, the spectrum of spaces is enormous, uh, and that's what we tried to uh, achieve uh, in, 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 in the building. Uh, and you, know, you, you, you have these kinds of cutouts, so you kind of register different uh, levels, and you see people move through it. So uh, by going down three floors, uh, there isn't a sense of claustrophobia by both controlling the sectional kind of dimensions, but also creating this porosity and the sense of layering, uh, so to speak. Uh, and then when you go down to this level, uh, it's much quieter. And the idea here was to create a quiet space that people could fill their thoughts with. It's not very heavily detailed. In fact, it's completely sparse. All the services are integrated in the book stack. So except for Wi-Fi codes, which are in these, I mean, um, uh, routers, nothing else is on the ceiling. Uh, and so this is what that area feels like. And this is the modulation of light as you adjust the louvers. Uh, and it even gets as luminous as that. And this is eight meters below the ground. So you basically don't need artificial light if you have the sun up there uh, in uh, terms. And these, are, these portals are the structure. Uh, and that's it. And there's, there's a Wi-Fi router there, which you'll see. Uh, and that's it. And it's, it's very sparse. It's very quiet. It's just the light that modulates, which gives you a sense of what's changing in the atmosphere upstairs. And, and the whole structure is supported by these three or four portals that go around. And it's sparse, except for the, the skylight. The corners are rooms, uh, which are like smaller rooms. So again, you have an intimacy of scale. This is the furniture going in now. These are the corner rooms with uh, that. And now we go up to the top, which is uh, it's much more luminous. It's open. Uh, it's white. Uh, it's intimate. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very transparent when it's opened. And these are the reading rooms and the reading facilities, uh, which have a completely different ambience where people work. It's going to be open 24-7. Uh, and uh, you have outdoor spaces where furniture will go in. These are meeting rooms outside uh, in the good weather that people can use so you don't disturb uh, the library. And the louvers, that's the catwalk, which has a thing for a harness. These are just construction workers doing it. And you can kind of adjust it. So we are working this manual out where these adjustments will be made twice a day uh, through the year to optimize, um, and, and it will be sort of uh, studied. And also the base was designed to create the sense of intimacy, the scale changes, students sort of use it to sit and to read. So you're reading outside the library, but you're engaging uh, with the space of the library. And it's very transparent. Uh, and so it also frames the landscape outside. That's a view through Doshi's building to the lawn, which I showed you in the first slide. That's the main entrance. So it's framing the building in, in different ways. And the outside is in concrete, in raw concrete. And the inside is sort of this plastered surface, but all dry construction. It's, it's drywall with steel. So because we, we actually did this building with design and construction in, uh, I think, 15 or 15 and a half or 16 months. So it was very quick. Uh, and so we had to deploy materials based on that, but also to demonstrate a spectrum of, buildings, uh, of building materials. So then when we go to buildings like corporate offices, which are slightly less contested than institutional buildings, I'm going to show you two corporate buildings here. Really, the patron and the client become one, and the users is what you negotiate with. I'm, I'm just flagging this out, not that that's what sort of uh, determines the design, but just to give you a sense of the spectrum of questions you might negotiate. And this is in Hyderabad which is in Cyberabad, which is a high-tech area. This is an early Google image. Now this is full of offices. That's by Mario Botta. There are many other buildings by different architects here. And we were given the site for an infrastructure company, which is a high-tech infrastructure company that has all the equipment wired. And what they do is they monitor through this control room 
projects happening in Jaipur, trucks have cameras, they're kind of high efficiency. And they, of course, wanted a glass monster. And uh, this is what happens in Hyderabad. Uh, this is Mercedes-Benz, and it's a glass building. But what you see is the nets, because uh, this was when the states were being divided. So there were riots like every second week, and a glass building is, an, you know, People just destroyed them. And so vendors who were selling you curtain glazing actually gave you a whole choice of fishing nets. Uh, so if you took blue glazing, you could take blue fishing net or white fishing net. So fishing net and its details, the fixing details, the stainless steel clamps came as part of the outfit of the curtain glazing. Because So it made you think that these images that globalization bring and what people identify with are so compelling that you're willing to even go to these sort of heights. We were, in, we were very much sort of um, inspired by this little hut. And there are about 100 huts like this put up in Jaipur. That guy works for the business association and the government partnership that puts these up. They're water coolers. They're put up in the summer. When he puts his kettle, he's open for business. It's clean water, which is very cool. People come, say hello. There are no plastic cups. They cup their hand. They drink the water. It's just like an amazingly inspiring thing that happens in Jaipur. Uh, and they set it. And every once in a while, he comes out and humidifies it with water. So through evaporative cooling, the hut stays very comfortable. In the hut, he has earthen pots, which again, through evaporative cooling, keep the water cool, and it's clean, uh, and it's just a very beautiful experience. And this blew us away, and we began to document it, and made this video, and measure temperature, uh, and just the beauty of this. We said, how can this inspire us to make a building in Hyderabad, which is not an equivalent kind of climate, which is dry and hot. So we kind of did this building, which is a five-story high garden. It's not a green wall. We haven't stuck the green on the wall. It's actually a performative screen, uh, which is humidified, and it allows the air to go through. We couldn't get a LEED certificate because we didn't seal our windows, and we didn't bother with air conditioning everywhere. But anyway, now India has modified the LEED sort of thing with Greha and many others, which look at these sort of other questions that are more relevant. So anyway, so this is where the misting happens. The facade actually acts as, and you know, and then you have three layers. One is a trestle, trellis on which uh, the, the facade grows. We tested it and you know, we tested different plants and saw how they grow. And so every facade can be different. And you go back at different seasons and the building looks different. And also a case of impatient capital. These guys wanted the building in 14 months. We negotiated with them that we'll take three years to grow the facade. They agreed. The cows went in to make the building sacred. The scaffolding was yet up. Our trellis was made through a small contractor near Hyderabad. Uh, so it helped him set up a business because he only bought one mold. Uh, and so again, this question of even craft, uh, we seem to fetishize craft when it's used for a very small spectrum of materials like wood and stone. And the idea here was how you take a material like aluminum in this case, uh, where we took recycled aluminum. So that's why you have different textures on it, uh, particular alloys that gave us a texture on this trellis so that even if it was burnt out, the plants, the trellis would look beautiful. Very small components, all handmade uh, in a 20-person uh, kind of plant that was set up. Uh, many women worked here. This is a large anodizing plant. And you can see the texture on it. It's got a lovely patina, uh, which came from the recycled mixed alloys of aluminum. And two people could carry it. It looks heavy, but it's very light. Two people assemble it. Over two years, it was assembled slowly. And that's with the plants and the misting system on a different grid, so different plants need. But the, the, the misting is to cool the building, not for the plants. The plants are actually cooled with drip irrigation in hydroponic trays. Sorry. Uh, okay, anyway, that's, uh, so, and so this is how it sort of becomes a woolly monster. You have to give it a haircut. It goes back and forth, so you've got to kind of control it. A base where the parking and the entrance is. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, even sectionally, uh, it has different volumes that sort of look at how air can, hot air can escape. This is the tendering department, so that's the only one that's sliced off because of privacy. Uh, and the podium, which creates social spaces uh, for people to congregate in. The flowers, when they bloom, uh, uh, and you know it, 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 yeah. And so sectionally, like I said, it sort of it has its own sort of 
intelligence in terms of the way it's articulated both for function. That building got a LEED certificate and we didn't. Uh, so, uh, you know, and so we've been sort of mapping it. And we did this sort of intuitively, I'll admit. My friends who are now sort of really into all this stuff have made me measure temperature and we are giving them data and they're going to try to analyze it now that it's been in operation for four or five years. Uh, but that's sort of, uh, and this is what it sort of feels like within the building. I use this slide and I often tell this story. This is an intern from Panama City who took this image. So it's not a stage image. But it made me think very deeply about what the building was about. And this is the Marty Chen quote that I shared with you that people of different economic. Now, the gardeners here are the poorest paid people uh, in a corporation like this. Normally, you'd have a garden. You'd see them toiling. The boss would go by in tinted glass, sort of a foreign imported car. There would be no eye contact. Here, the lowest paid people, the gardeners, there are two things about them. One is they're in your face. You negotiate them all the time. But the other is that the identity of the building depends on them, because the facade depends on how well the gardeners sort of operate. And there's a kind of empathy here. But, you know, empathy is, I think, not enough. Uh, and I think this is a very particular situation. It's made me think how in the US, for example, people who collect trash in the evening from our university, can they be surfaced and in ways that the role they play be made more dignified? Of course, it's more complex. Here, because the garden is linked to the identity of the building, I think people get a kind of particular position here within that hierarchy, which is amazing. And so this woman wouldn't have worn a sari if she wasn't in the face of her bosses. She would have been in much more ordinary clothes if she was just working in the garden. And so that sort of reversal, I, I think, is something very interesting because they're really the heroes of the building. Uh, and you know, here is someone working, they're working, there's a kind of coexistence. Uh, there are blinds there, so you can put the blind down if you want to cut somebody off, but that doesn't happen. And if you go to their website and you know, other blogs, it's amazing the kind of friendships that have developed. Again, unintended. It's not like we set out to design to do this, but it's a feedback that we are sort of enjoying now uh, to address uh, you know, things in the future. This led us to extend these ideas, this idea of the building as a social condenser, for a building that we were asked to do in Europe. This is the first building we've done in Europe, and it's on the Novartis ca campus on Basel, and that's our building. It was one of two on the river. Uh, we were lucky to get that sort of site. And it's a site plan done by, as you know, Vittorio Lumpugnani, and it's a very strict, rigorous, you know, European uh, ordered site plans, so the footprints are sort of very determined and the envelope is determined and I suppose they had one triangular site so they gave it to Frank Gehry but everybody else got, <laughs> you know, the big rectangles. Uh, that's what it looks like in, in, in progress, so our building was there. Now they've of course developed this whole landscape and it's, it's kind of transformed a lot. This is an old image and that was sort of the, the conceptual model that we first presented. But this was interesting because, of course, we studied all the buildings because they've documented each building uh, in a beautiful book. And it was remarkable that we found that the footprint was fixed. And then everyone was given the two ducts for the services because these are labs, so the services are incredibly intense. So these were large bundle ducts, and we felt when you do that, you create a zoning, you create these hard thresholds, you segregate lab from administrative staff, you know, a whole hierarchy of people in any organization. And so this was difficult to do with the Swiss, but with the 10 or 15 consultants to negotiate with them, how we would disaggregate the ducts. So that would give us a clean footprint where we could modulate space in, in much more interesting ways. And finally, they agreed with circulation. So for fire, it was actually even more efficient. Uh, and they accepted this. And it's the only building on the campus that broke away from this. The other thing we did, again, I think coming from Mumbai, where you're always trying to manipulate space, this comes naturally to us. Most people accepted the envelope, accepted that because the labs needed five meters, that you would do five floors, which were five meters, and everyone was in there. We questioned the idea that the administration, which didn't have heavy services, didn't need more than 2.4 meters, which means we could get more floors on one side, which means that we would save area, which means that we could have carved a courtyard out, uh, which could create, again, a wonderful space as a greenhouse, both for cooling. And this building is all leads. It's got complicated geothermal systems. But we thought we could add through the greenhouse uh, a, a way of heating the building, cooling it with skylights that are openable. And they agreed to that. We were surprised. But these two little shifts 
opened up all sorts of possibilities. So then we got a section where you had these shafts which were disaggregated, you got a garden there, uh, and you got split levels because the levels varied. So like I showed you in the sept building, you got these sectional, uh, you got vistas sectionally which connected more than one level at a time, which is, it's a much more social space as a result because more people are making eye contact, more people are climbing only half levels to meet people, and so uh, those incidents are much more. We were worked with Gunther Wolf from uh, Zurich uh, to conceptualize this garden uh, at the center, which would also be performative. Uh, on the facade, he created a registry of the seasons with 28 species, which would actually map and burn out, and something would uh, you know, bloom at any given time. Uh, and the other side where we face the Rhine, actually this has blinds which are automated, but in this image, it's sort of all open. And that's what sort of the building uh, looks like. Uh, this is the ground floor where you get glimpses of these different labs as you move through it. Uh, these are the disaggregated ducts, so you come through it, the meeting rooms, and then your conference room on the riverside. Uh, you go up this large stair, so it's a very kind of transparent space, and you get glimpses of the labs as you go through it. Uh, at, from different points. The artwork, we collaborated with Pipiloti Rist uh, from, uh, uh, from Zurich, and she created these video installations through the building, and they're kind of these warm showers of color uh, that you walk through uh, in the winter uh, as you pass through the building. And so they appear in different sort of locations, and then these are the intermediate levels where uh, the office, which is much lower, kind of blurs into the garden. These are meeting areas that actually bridge the labs and the office area, so they become very social social spaces because both groups can uh, use them uh, very easily and then you frame the, the views of the Rhine River. These are some of the labs which is furniture designed by Toshiko Mori. She was appointed by no artist to do that and this was the first one that she fitted out. Uh, and you know, the, it's very loose spaces between the labs and the other more common areas uh, which they, they, they respond to all the requirements of the lab but just this transparency allows it to become a much more social space and it's always half levels. So you climb through the building much more easily. These are meeting rooms where that's a, that's a you know, flat screen and these become seminar rooms uh, actually in the garden. Uh, and there you see the relationship between the two from the, from the labs you see through the office uh, to the Rhine River. Uh, but this green, which is a greenhouse, so it's performative too, uh, also becomes a kind of social condenser uh, at the center of the building. And this just gives you the feeling of the, the sectional quality uh, of the, the mid-level and the way these are framed uh, through different apertures as you sort of uh, walk around it. Uh, and that's sort of just a detail. I come to the last two uh, projects, which take you completely uh, to another sort of uh, spectrum of uh, questions, uh, which is uh, working in India, one can't sort of uh, avoid dealing with these really harsh social questions. Uh, and uh, here, sometimes the clients don't exist, sometimes patrons don't exist, some of these are self-initiated, the users are often hard to even connect to. Uh, they're wicked problems, as we would sort of define them. And I quote Pratap Bhanu Mehta, who is now the vice chancellor of the Ashoka University, used to be the, the head of the Center for Policy Research, and to quote him, because this sort of captures what, as an architect, we sort of deal with, and to quote him. In a society riven by deep inequality, there's not even the minimal basis for mutual concern. Where social distance makes human beings almost a different species in each other's eyes. Why would you expect anything else? Why would a contractor care if one of his construction workers used his hands rather than a brush to apply a dangerous chemical? The more inequality there is, the harder it is to imagine what it's like to be in someone else's shoes. It has to be admitted that even the most well-meaning and sensitive find it hard to imagine what the suffocation, darkness, and sheer physical suffering of being at the bottom of the social hierarchy might really be like. The very thing you would expect to instigate questions of justice makes it hard to even raise them." Unquote. And this is really something, you know, when I read this, I realized, gosh, one is dealing with that every day when one is dealing with some of these problems. And you see the level of poverty except for Goa and, or Kerala, sorry, and Kashmir, which is highly subsidized, and Goa, which is a small state. I mean, the country is just largely below the poverty line. And within this, I mean, there are many projects one can share, but I want to share one low-cost housing project and a sanitation project. 
This is Dharavi or what most places where a majority or half the population in a city like Mumbai live. I often share this story. This is an image I took accidentally. I mean, I took this as one of many images, but when I downloaded it on my laptop, I was sort of really moved. I had goosebumps because what it made me think about was my kids going to school would look like that. This child is intact. Look at the white socks, the, the tie. He's going off to school, jumping over the compound wall, lives in one of those huts. And what it made me think about was he probably defecated in the open because he has no access to a toilet. And so to have someone that intact, I mean, what is the role? What is the agency of design? And so open defecation is like a massive, massive problem. You might not read this so clearly, but I just want to make a point that India is got the highest open defecation in the world. Uh, it's like way above any other country. I mean, even Africa, where we might think this would happen. Now, whether it's cultural, whether it's a density. So this is detailed mapping we've done, even in Mumbai, according to wards, so you realize where this happens. So we've been sort of pursuing this with an NGO in Mumbai. If you look at just the statistics in Mumbai, the UN habitat says it's one is to 1,440 people. One toilet, one WC for 1,440 people. Mind-boggling. Spark, the NGO we partnered with, says it's one is to 800. They have other ways of calculating it. The Bombay Municipal Corporations, Corporation's aspiration, which means their target, is one is one is to 50, which means six families would share a toilet, which means you'd have to have a lottery every morning, or you'd have to have a system that once in 50 days you would be able to use the WC, which is ridiculous. It's shameful that even as a society we have an aspiration like that. Our prime minister has made this a big agenda, and he said that you know, he wants construction of toilets in every household by 2019. Amazing. I mean, really brave of him to have uh, done this. But the question is, I think we as designers have to be part of this debate, because if I look at that, can I get a toilet to everyone in, by 2019? It's impossible. It's, I mean, totally impossible. So what is the government doing? They're, they've got factories. They've said they've built two million toilets. They build these toilets. A truck goes around every village and dumps it outside the village. Research has shown that these toilets are the only you know, solidly constructed thing. So it's used for storage of grain, jewelry. It's used for everything but a toilet uh, because it's got no relationship to the house. So the question really is that as designers, we need to think about transitions. We don't give enough attention to what it means to design for transitions because we think in absolute terms. And so the transition to solving this problem is community toilets, which is what the World Bank is doing, which is where we got involved. But what this is what they design. And some people use it. Some people defecate outside here. For women and children, it's really dangerous. So there are many problems associated to it. And this NGO, Spark, that we worked with had been appointed to built 300 of these. So we got involved and we began to develop a prototype where we said we'd segregate the men and women. We used a facade like we had developed, which would be flowers. So people might pluck flowers to use for prayer. That would be wonderful, being very idealistic. Uh, we put the caretaker's house on top of the toilet. He got the penthouse, which is usually the lowest caste, which is also a politic there. The space here became a community space for children, women. I got a client to donate solar panels so we could get it off the grid so children could study in the community space at night. It looked really great, and we started trying to build them. Uh, we tried. This one got stopped at the plinth level because the government said, this is too iconic. Uh, we are going to be removing the slums. So why are you creating a community center? We tried building in many locations. and the eighth attempt, we managed to build one in a real hurry, the solar panels in this sort of uh, uh, squatter settlement. Uh, it became a nice space, bamboo slats, very well protected in the rain. Children used it. The solar panels went up. That's housing that was built 20 years ago by the government, which didn't manage to relocate the slum dwellers, which means that this is a problem of transitions. And how do we design for transitions becomes uh, an incredibly important important question. And then I went back six or nine months later and it completely failed. I realized that this was a case where I was working with the operational client, which was the NGO. I had no patron, the politicians, the World Bank, I had no access to them. I had no access to the users. It was a complete mistake. A local politician had taken the money 
to build this uh, and was running it and then made it into a kind of club that's actually a television to watch cricket matches. There are rum bottles lying there. There's a bed where they sit on and the government was building another toilet. Complete disaster. Of course, Beckett tells you, fail again, fail better. And so we entered a competition by the Gates Foundation. We won the first prize. It was an international competition where we embedded it even much more, made it reversible that it could be dismantled and the material recycled. We put shops there. We put a laundromat into it. It was a wonderful idea and the way it worked, but again, we weren't successful because, I don't know, the, the supply chain to make it happen wasn't on the ground, and so we won the competition, but couldn't make it operational. Symbolically, we said it should be across from the temple, etc. So, this is a project we are pursuing. I think it questions us as dis in terms of our disciplinary engagement on the, the notion, like I just said, does permanence matter? It's become a default condition when we design. Uh, in today's world of flux, we need to think about those imaginations. In the same way, we think in terms of absolutes when we are solving these problems, whether it's housing or it's public sanitation. How do we imagine the space of transitions? And, the, you know, and transitions sometimes take you away from a kind of linear trajectory. The, the challenge always is how you come back to target, but I think it's a, worth sort of designing. And I'm going to now share with you my last project and the most complex one, which is for these guys who are mahuts. Uh, they look after elephants. Uh, this was a competition in Jaipur, which again we won. And here, of course, it's, 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 this is really a complex project. It's now been on for 12 or 13 years. Uh, here, these were differentiated in mind-blowing ways. Uh, the patron here was the chief minister who uh, called for the competition uh, and you know, awarded the project. The clients were the public works department and agencies that changed every six months depending on who was in power, which I'll show you in a second. And the users were the elephants and the mahouts. And in this case, we kind of negotiated all three, uh, which is why I think the project is happening. Uh, I presented this year at Columbia uh, seven years ago, and I remember Ken reminded me today, I used to go to the site after the first two years with my resignation letter because I, I thought every time I'm going to sort of resign, and I'll show you what that meant. Of course, uh, the pink city, Jaipur, tourism, elephants became sort of very much part of that whole landscape. They take, uh, they take tourists up to Amber Palace. They get painted. And because there's no water, their skins discolor because these are toxic, these, uh, these paints that are used. They get, go rogue. Uh, actually, it doesn't get reported. They've killed tourists because they go rogue in the summer, can't be controlled. Uh, the government created housing for them, which was like you know the mahouts living up there with like garages, all the elephants here. That doesn't work. So the mahouts have all had moved down because the the relationship between the mahout and the elephant is incredibly complex for him to build a relationship to control the elephant. Uh, and so this was a complete failure. So they had the competition. This was a piece of land which had been quarried by sand contractors. It was almost initially unbuildable. Of course, we, there's a lot of research of how much water they need, how do we capture it. So we made it a landscape project. And I think that's why we won the competition, because we beat the drums on the idea that if you didn't have water, there was no point doing a project like this, because elephants are tropical beings. And for them to be in a desert climate of Rajasthan in outside Jaipur was like unbelievable. And so that was the site as we got it. There were some buildings that were sort of uh, abandoned, which we integrated finally. We found the path of water through Google, and that was the site that we finally colonized. And we created a series of micro dams to capture water from different directions because of the topography, uh, to create water bodies. This part isn't done yet. It's been finished up to there. And that's sort of the site plan. Many buildings, the brief was only houses for 100 elephants, but we added by repairing some of the buildings, we said we should create a school, a visitor center, and there are other things we have suggested, which were initiated by us as part of the project. Now, in 2007, when we got the site, that's the same hill, and this is the transformation over 10 years. Uh, this transformation happened in the first few years because the public works department built the buildings because the kickbacks are in the construction. Landscape wasn't even a tender item, which we had to you know, struggle to fight for, to create these ponds, etc. And then the government fell. So the BJP government, which initiated the project, a chief minister called Vasundara Raje, a woman, really well organized, very motivated. The Congress came into power, and as happens in many places, they abandoned the last government's project, so it was completely abandoned. But that was great because, I mean, I was frustrated. I thought, what the hell am I doing? How am I going to wait for another three or five years for these guys to come back, if at all? 
but in hindsight, it was fantastic because it allowed the landscape to generate because it was abandoned. No one lived there for three years. But the DNA, the bones were there, so the plants began to grow, and now, of course, it's sort of completely green. We, of course, paid attention to the architecture. They wanted row houses, but we sort of did a cluster development. We made eight, the only three or 400 square feet a house with a little room for the elephant, but we kind of created a series of courtyards. So if these three families got together, they actually had a mansion because they had a large public space, which was their private space with a, a wall that surrounded it, courtyards for every house, flat slabs so they could build on the terraces and they could colonize it, uh, and how it would mutate. The elephants have a separate entrance, uh, but they participate in the courtyard, and those are the sort of uh, rooms. Uh, and these are just sort of drawings which, and one of the reasons I carried that resignation letter is every time I would, you know, send them beautiful details of stone gargoyles to celebrate how water is captured, I would go to site and I would find a PVC pipe instead. And I would freak out and the PWD engineer would look at me and say that, even my home doesn't have such details. So, you know, so there was this, this whole hierarchy we understood. Uh, in a, in a, and in a state like that, it's very complex. And that's what made us keep fighting back because we began to feel that it could be a mission. So, Ken, the reason I didn't give them that resignation letter finally, like I threatened when I spoke here at Columbia seven years ago, was because then one said, let's make it a mission, and I'm glad we did. And so that's the elephant's room with a higher ceiling where they store the food, and it allows the cooling and the ventilation, so all these kind of climatic principles. Elephants can't sleep on flat ground. They need a kind of berm depending on their size, otherwise they can't get up. And so this is like our mock-ups to see what sizes would be for what elephants, and I jokingly say this is my work version of small, medium, large, and extra large. <laughs> so this is what it sort of looked like, uh, it, you know, the first water body that's Ambare, where they go to work. And these were the first sort of uh, clusters that got built, uh, you know, windows. So the kids who are going to, some of whom will become Mahouts, could interact with the elephants, uh, social space, but just basically things we anticipated would mutate, people would plaster, paint. Those were the expectations when they would be allocated. This is a guy coming home now. You can see that slope. Different people treat their space differently because these weren't allocated. This, this basically, people started moving in. The government abandoned it. The new government didn't want to deal with it. Some clusters flourished because of the water. So these guys have flowers. They sell flowers. They have lawns. This is the aspiration of the middle class in Jaipur. Um, but, and the middle class in Jaipur have to get tankers of water because there is no water supply on a regular basis. So again, an unintended uh, uh, consequence. We didn't go ahead to design that we would we would turn this inequity because of the water. We just went ahead to design a robust environment and armature for life. But these are the consequences that we sort of were very pleased to see. And these were some of the abandoned ones where they hadn't allocated people homes, which the trees just grew. It began to become environments. And then as people moved in, life corrodes housing. People began to use the outside for kitchen, the trees. Uh, this just, it became not, a, not like a squatter settlement. They had some access to getting the houses, but there was no government patronage. The goats moved in, the trees grew, the elephants coexisted. The environment began to transform. People had dish antennas. So there was an economy that was evolving just because the housing and the water existed. But there was no government patronage in all these years. And the other consequence was this is Ambare. Uh, this is what they do. They take people up these ramparts, which is a very difficult job. And as Ken was describing to me earlier, it's a whole city. Uh, and so it's... A, a lot of area, they work, walk back from work. It's horrible conditions, 50 degrees centigrade in the summer. Uh, but now, of course, these are images from 2007. They can have a snack going to work. We had just sort of planted trees. Uh, this was all in the initial years, which I'll show you how it's transformed. But it began to create a different uh, kind of environment. But the water, which we thought was to support life, actually the other unintended consequence of it was the bonding between the mahout and the elephant. So what they told us as feedback is besides their health improving, they behave much better with us because through the process of bathing, the mahout and the elephant actually bonds very deeply. And so again, that was one of these consequences. Uh, and here you see him bathing the elephants. I mean, they just love this in that heat. Uh, and this is, again, something that we were uh, very, very pleased with. And you see their skins and how badly they've discovered. They're much healthier now. And then as time has gone back, there have been little dribbles of fun. So we managed to you know, create these embankments. You can see the local species, the kikard as they're called, have flourished. Uh, but again, the general infrastructure hasn't happened. 
Elephants are social beings. Uh, they have to hang out with their buddies. If you tie them for the whole day alone, they go kind of, they start freaking out. So every few hours they have to come together and they hang out. So we created these kind of pavilions. But again, uh, uh, unintended consequence of this was we didn't realize now the Mahouts had teenage kids. And they started a company called Elephantastic. And they had a website, and tourists could book time, and they charged you 100 rupees to feed the elephant. If you want to bath with the elephants, 500 rupees. If you go to TripAdvisor, this is one of, at one point, this was like the highest hit in Jaipur, uh, especially for younger uh, tourists who are what their Facebook page is, so they have to post that image with elephants. So, so there's a whole economy that sort of developed out of this. Again, again, I mean, again, just in reflection, the fact that we made, I think, the right decisions in terms of supporting uh, life there. Now, this is just, again, in summary. This is a mapping I did recently for an exhibition at the GSD. 2006 is when we won the competition. I'm sorry. 2007, they begin to build those houses. 2008, a little more happens, and the government begins to dwindle here. It falls. The Congress takes over, and this is the BJP government coming back to power. This is the political system. This is the actors involved. So we had the tourism department and the Umber Development Authority, the PWD. Every few months, you can see the agency changed. Uh, now we are finally with the zoo authority and the forest department, which I'll tell you in a second. And so these are letters. I, I wrote a letter every month to the chief minister, whoever's in power, to make a case for this, uh, which was like incredible. Uh, and in this period, I, when the new government came, I wrote some letters, and I got no responses. So I was frustrated. Till then, we were at our own cost going to site every month just to keep working with the Mahouts and the elephants to keep that user group as part of our sort of allies. And then at some point, out of the blue, we got a, you know, with Glenn Merkitt on the, as the chair of the jury, we got a gold medal from the University of Ferrara for the most sustainable project of the year. And so I wrote to the chief minister with that certificate, and I said, you know, you need to pay attention to this project. And this January, I got a call from her, met her, presented, and she put, this is the same one who started the process, and finally, after being abandoned for these three, four years completely with trickles here, with this kind of advocacy and lobbying, it was really our connection to the Mahouts and the elephants in this case, and a different kind of access to the chief minister that helped the project. Because the animal activists were against the government, but because we had the elephants on our side, we could negotiate with them. That's how the forest department and the zoo authority have been bought into. It became a very complex kind of set of negotiation. And this just tells you that in more detail and these are all the elaborate letters making a case for it uh, and uh, you know uh, writing to her and trying to get the project going and that's finally you know um, uh, where and that's a letter from her on the government letterhead calling me Rahul Ji with great respect and inviting me to make a presentation and then in this nine months uh, it's going ahead and finishing in December it's unbelievable but also because she's up for election in January and in, in March and in December the election code comes into play so she can't spend money after that so she's getting it completed and of course there's a deeper politic here which I'm happy to share. So in the last three months uh, these are things that have happened, a gateway in the Jaipur pink, you can see all the planting done over 500 more trees have been planted just in the last six months uh, pens have been created these will all be covered with creepers and plants, uh, this sort of contains groups of elephants and these are where they'll hang out with water troughs, so this is all under construction, I mean as we speak there are like 100 people working there. These are lookout spots which will be very heavily shaded where groups can sit and be explained uh, things about the elephants and their operation. We are now ma have made proposals for swales to capture water, to stabilize berms. Uh, there's a lot of grass planting that's been done. These are, again, natural local species. Many more of these pavilions that have been built. And then, you know, six months ago, we suggested to them that, look, right in the center here, we should do just a four-room guest house and it's not a boutique hotel but a place that people can actually stay at night and be at this sort of place and spend time and they accepted the idea and it's sort of under construction uh, it's been built it's on one of these water bodies that's what the model looks like it's just four rooms and a dining facility around a courtyard with a very discreet entrance from the rear overlooking uh, the water and it's a very simple plan all built in sort of local material uh, large slabs of stone that make this portal to enter 
uh, just bamboo for the pergola overlooking the water bodies and a courtyard where people can, if they spend the night and they're having a scotch over dinner, it's very discreet, it's not sort of in your face, and it uses just these two simple materials and a little steel uh, to span the floors uh, uh, to make the guest house, so it's very discreet. What has also happened now is this is women from the government who are working with the wives of the mahouts, uh, and this is also going to create another source of employment because the wives of the mahouts, and by the way, the mahouts are all from the Muslim community, which is a minority community, community in Rajasthan, so that also is a very complicated dynamic, but these women are going to run this game guest house and choose uh, how, you know, what food is sort of served there uh, and actually maintain it. And so, again, it creates another form of employment. It wasn't part of the brief. It just came up as an idea. And then the Mahouts had many of their friends who were inmates in the local jail. Uh, and so they said we should furnish it because these guys are really good with furniture. So these are the inmates who have produced all the beautiful furniture for the guest house. So there's a kind of link. And I just got an email today that the guy who was really good with a particular kind of chair got released yesterday, so we won't have those five chairs because he might not do it. And then, <laughs> and then, of course, now it's attracting a lot of birds. So as people are getting allocated houses, Rajasthan has a great sort of history of craft. They're beginning to decorate their houses. They're beginning to tell stories. And who knows, there'll be all sorts of narratives told through the architecture. And this is what I mean. Life corrodes, I mean, housing corrodes architecture. The lowest parts of the site are actually as dense as that, where the water naturally collects. Uh, and it's completely transformed the landscape. And this is just the last slide, uh, where now there's another generation. So one of the buildings that had been abandoned, we've also repaired that. And actually, an American NGO took it upon themselves to run a school there for these kids because there are now some 50 or 60 young children who need a sort of school. So I just want to sort of summarize by saying that working in Mumbai, for me, I use that more emblematically, is about negotiating these sort of global flows uh, that, that do not erase and remake landscapes, but rather occupy local fissures to create fascinating hybrid conditions and really startling adjacencies which one has to discern and operate within. The design challenge in this condition depends on how we make these disparate worlds blur. Can the threshold between them be spatially softened? As a practitioner, social access and its clear relationship to the articulation of spatial arrangements becomes a critical aspect of design. This is not about the city of the rich and the poor or the regular models of the formal or informal or many other such binaries that are often used to explain cities in the south. And Central America, Latin America, Asia, Africa. Rather, it's what I call the kinetic space, a space of flux, where these descriptive concepts collapse into singular entities and where meanings are ever shifting and blurred, sometimes even if just temporarily. The question for architects, conservationists, urban designers, planners then becomes, can we design for this space of blur, of flux? Can we design with a divided mind? And more importantly, how might we be inspired by the design intelligence of what is produced by this flux, which is the kinetic city, and intervene as designers and activists in our own localities? Can we use design to construct soft thresholds that facilitate porosity, both spatially and socially? Across our projects, the approach has been uh, to, um, has been, uh, you know, to create a kind of, uh, has been an aspiration uh, to place our work in the context of democracy, as Ken sort of introduced the thrust of uh, the lecture. Uh, and therefore, deconstructing and unpacking, to use that word, what the client really means and what those dynamics are in a democracy becomes important, which is the site of our operation India. Furthermore, we have attempted to interpret spatial arrangements as well as building elements to meet contemporary sensibilities, as well as building vocabulary that respond to this condition. The attempt clearly is to combine resources while juxtaposing conventional craftsmanship with industrial materials, tradition and architectural arrangements with contemporary spatial planning. In short, to give expression to what I believe are the multiple worlds, the pluralism and the dualities so that so vividly characterize the Indian as well as the South Asian uh, landscape. And I think that the challenge in this kind of pluralistic environment is to, um, it, it, it really requires requires planning and design um, attitudes
attitudes and mechanisms that continually negotiate between the differences in architecture as the sole instrument for placemaking and the temporality that creates the condition for habitation and celebration. It must include the state and market, the empowered and the poor, rather than allow one entity to prevail and remake the city in its own image or the habitat in its own image. This is what makes, for me, working in Mumbai and the landscape of India unique, challenging, and, and very challenging. Here, extreme differences exist in very close proximity. They're in your face and not distant or abstract. And a pluralistic society, I think, is one that not only accepts this difference, but also goes beyond to understand and even be influenced, influenced by it in productive ways. And this is a threat in India in many ways in its political climate. That is really to see the simultaneous validity of differences. Because once the architect and planner sees these various differences as being simultaneously valid, the challenge is how do you go beyond these polarized binaries through the making of architecture, of soft thresholds and spaces that are porous, plural in spirit expression, and most critically, encompassing of a context and the context of the context as its nourishment. And I think this is really the aspiration of my practice, our practice. We are aware that many of the conditions I've described are really emblematic of the issues and crises we are facing in many parts of the globe. The contemporary world uh, and the contemporary world that we collectively occupy. Understanding this crisis and articulating it in terms that are useful for us as designers, I believe, is a crucial step. Uh, because otherwise, the sphere of our concerns and the sphere of our influence will always be segregated. And after all, as Paul Romer from the World Bank said, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Thank you very much. Yes. Well, I'm supposed to respond, but I mean, how can one respond really to, to, a, uh, to a lecture which is like four lectures in one, five, six, maybe even, and um, with such, um, given with such intensity and with such, um, with such experience and, and uh, makes one realize, you know, that I think this question of <clears throat> the Yes, the challenge is, is, of course, worldwide, but provinciality is everywhere, and one sometimes thinks of uh, one's own uh, environment as being a center, but in fact, of course, we know that in other countries, what, what, there are cultures of architecture and of urbanism and of, um, and of landscape which are you know, more intense and, and uh, um, more, I think, challenging, but also richer than what we experience, I mean, here, I think, in, uh, in the East Coast. And, um, I mean, there are so many points that have been raised, but, I mean, one of the things that the, uh, the entire lecture makes me think about is this aphorism that is uh, apocryphally attributed to Le Corbusier, which is, to design, you need talent, to program, you need genius. And I think what um, has come across this evening is, you know, the capacity of Raoul, uh, to engage in uh, programming, you know, to, in fact, you know, of course, with regard to the elephant village, so-called, in Amber, Jaipur, uh, you know, it was a question of inventing a program in a way, and, and then also, uh, as it were, um, uh, continuing to cultivate a program to, under very difficult circumstances. This, this concept that he has uh, articulated um, quite a few times during the course of the lecture, of negotiating local flows. I think um, that's what I, um, amongst many other things that I've noted here, that's what I would, um, yes, which I will take away from this lecture, and I imagine many of you will do the same. Before we finally um, um, conclude this evening's events, I, I would like to open the floor to any, any questions or comments that Raoul might uh, be able to answer just a few, maybe, or depends. Um, aside from the project for Novartis, what is the geographical range of the project that you showed us? All India. It's it, all in India, and uh, yeah, they're all in India. Uh, but you mean within India, where they were here? Yeah. So uh, uh, 
uh, Ahmedabad, the libraries in Ahmedabad, which is north of Bombay, and Jaipur is a little north of that. Uh, what else did I? At KMC, which is the office building with the green facade, is South India, which is in Hyderabad. We have a lot of work in Chennai, which I didn't show. Um, we're also doing some things in Delhi, in many other parts, which of course I haven't included. But outside India, we've uh, built in Europe one building, and uh, we've done a small building in Oman, which was for a set of buildings for an Indian client. And I've done a I think I'm the only Indian architect who's built in Pakistan. Uh, so I've done a project in Pakistan, in Karachi, uh, which is another story, but yes. But otherwise, it's largely based in India, Novartis. And we've done some competitions, which are well, other geographies, Sydney and you know, other places. So. That's a question back there. Uh, so the decline in pluralism in India can be ascribed to many forces, and the BJP could certainly, at the, especially at the national level, yes. be one of those forces. What was that tension like in dealing with the BJP at the state level in working um, in Jaipur? Uh, completely different, um, uh, just because of the person involved in PA, the chief minister, who comes from a completely different uh, background. Uh, she's aligned with the BJP as... You obviously seem to be someone who knows those nuances. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, it, it, I think completely differently. And I think uh, for someone who might know the kind of nuances within the BJP, uh, there are clear tensions between uh, some states and the center on some of these questions. Uh, my own sense in retrospect is uh, I think uh, she kept this, when I'm saying this in public carefully, but with all good intent, I think she kept this as a late priority, so she wasn't responding to those letters in the first years of her coming back to PA, because to suddenly take a project which was for the Muslim community would have created other controversies, because there were many other things that had to be done in the state. So it's much safer towards the end, uh, I think sequentially for her, perhaps. I'm just guessing why I didn't get the responses earlier, and suddenly I got these responses. So this is a, I mean, I said this is something that I think we are in India threatened about today, just the way the nationalism has gone, well, in the U.S. too. Uh, it's all gone so right that it's becoming almost ridiculous and dangerous. Uh, and, um, uh, and I think in that context, uh, I think she stands out as being different in terms of um, uh, the kind of uh, extreme line she's taking. It's, I, I don't believe it's as extreme as what the National Registry is doing. Does that answer your question? Hi, could you um, speak a little bit more to sort of the role of urban planning or the discipline of urban planning in the projects that you have or your experience? Just because you sort of talk about how, you know, it wasn't part of the original intent to have this sort of social agenda to the project at the beginning, but then it kind of came as a result. But, you know, I mean, the definition of planning is to like think ahead of time to you know, be able to, and then you maybe perhaps use architecture to actually implement it. But I don't know if you could just speak to that a little yeah, bit, so that I, relationship. Yeah. So I think for me, just sort of reflecting on 25 years of practice, uh, for me that's all a blur. In a sense, I, I, I don't see the silo so clearly. I, I don't have a degree in urban planning, but headed a department, so kind of learned on the job did work, like for me, so, so for me the definition of urban design is about advocacy. So for me urban design, when I graduated in urban design in 87 here, you know, the projects in New York, uh, Cesar Pelli, Battery Park City, and all of that were the celebrated things. In North America, urban design became big architecture. Uh, I didn't see it like that from what I'd understood. And when I went back, I remember when I came to do my job talk for my position, everyone is expecting big architectural projects. I had a few documents, which was about legislation and advocacy we had done in the historic district. Because for me, urban design is a bridge practice, which sort of bridges the abstraction of planning and the site specificity of architecture. And it creates feedback loops. And in the process of creating feedback loops is intrinsically about advocacy. So that's what, that's the way I've understood it. 
planning is about discerning patterns. I'm saying this in a simplistic way. And I think in the US and many parts of the world, it's lost its speculative edge completely. Uh, and so uh, for various reasons. And so uh, I think in today's world, the way it's coming back is the integrative practice of multiple disciplines that look at territorial dimensions where landscape ends and planning starts and the arguments that landscape is originally planning and you know all of that. It's, I think these all come together and I think that's the way in reflection one, so I, I, I wasn't so articulate about this if you had asked me this 20 years ago, but in reflection I saw that we were intuitively working with these streams and oscillating between different uh, protocols of different practices and different disciplines simultaneously. Uh, and so where planning ends and begins and architecture ends and begins uh, for me has been less consequential. Thank you for a wonderful talk. It was really inspiring. And I just wanted to um, ask you to talk a little bit more about this notion of transitions that you brought up. And you mentioned how um, you thought that this was one of the most important things that we need to be designing for. And so I wanted to ask you a little bit, what sort of transitions are you really talking about? Uh, I mean, it seemed like the social transitions are, are, are really important to you. Yeah. But uh, so I wanted to give you a chance to just get into that a little bit more. And also the role that objects, architectural objects in this case, play in those transitions. Um, you gave us a number of projects. Um, and there was one which you had to stabilize the courtyard. There was an existing building there that, that had been encroached upon. Uh, the Chamala Palace. And, yeah, and, you'd, and you helped to sort of stabilize the boundary. And a number of these projects um, are about boundary making. And the Elephant Project, when you uh, showed us the, uh, the, 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 the guest house, you talked about the wall as a sort of divider between the guests that would come and the, and the residents. So, um, the role of, of objects in these transitions in, in sort of articulating these transitions, how, could you talk a little bit more about how you see that? And is it a way of easing transitions or of quickening transitions uh, or, or just how you, you see that? Thank you. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with the second part of the, the, the borders, the wall, the mount. And you know, in all those, I should have maybe emphasized that they're all simultaneously porous and, uh, and definitive. So in that little guest house, one whole edge or one L is just those bamboo pergolas with a transparent veranda uh, and a dining area where people can sit and watch the water body or night observe it. And on the other side, it has a sense of a boundary. So it's, I mean, I'm sort of interested in how one can engage with that simultaneity so that it, 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 it serves both purposes and it can be modulated depending on use. So there's a kind of level of flexibility. So whether it's the facade and the way the gardeners can um, uh, transgress the space, but it also is a facade, so it's a containment for that building. So I think I'm interested in, in, in the SEP library, similarly sectionally, et cetera, that you're in quiet space or you're in spaces where you can have meetings, but they're visually connected and yet sort of not mutually exclusive in that sense. So I'm interested in creating those blurs uh, using sectional qualities and articulations, but also planar qualities. So to go to the transitions, I mean, of course, that's a much, much more complicated question. So I think at the most abstract level, for me, what's interesting, landscape as a discipline does this in some ways, not adequately, but it does it just by the nature of the discipline and the fact that you're dealing with nature in a particular way, uh, is the question of time. I don't think we've addressed this, whether it's planning. I think for me, preservation and, or conservation, as I prefer to call it, we can debate that, I know, uh, is also about a society. It's an instrument of planning that helps a society modulate the rate of change. It's the way I see it uh, as part of a kind of planning repertoire. Now, there are questions of memory and the other complex layers that we can get into, which I know you're interested in. But so for me, transition at the most abstract level is about how you deal with time. Then I think as a designer, it's a, how does one extend that? Uh, and I think the transitions are, I mean, energy is a big question. And uh, urban flux is a big question. How are we going to make this transition if three 
or 300 million people are moving between places. What does that mean for design? I mean, one banal example is imagining a whole spectrum of rental kinds of housing that can change, dormitory, sharing, all of that. So people talk about that. In energy, it's clearer. So in energy, for example, India is trying to make a transition from fossil fuels to renewables. If we try to make that jump, our economy will collapse. So we are going the nuclear way with the bushes. We sign these deals, Manmohan Singh. Now we might get trapped in nuclear, or we might find our transition through nuclear. So you go off into other directions. And that's the point with the community toilets, that if you have to change this culture of open defecation through infrastructure facilities, sometimes you've got to you got to go to a form uh, that might help you make that transition because by doing that, you create a collective your culture of collective consensus. That's why the community center on top of the thing where you, and therefore then you can upgrade those squatter settlements or slums or favelas or auto construct, whatever tab you want to give it. So these are all interconnected. And I think it's multiple strategies that I think spatial imagination can help inform. And I don't think we have a voice on that debate. So the solutions become absolute, which means erase the slum, we'll have public housing or, make two factories that make prefabricated toilets and give everyone a toilet. These are absolute solutions. So it's, I think, a choice between, which also shouldn't be posed as a binary. There's an in-between spectrum there, between the absolute and the transitionary. And I think as designers, our pedagogy, both taking permanence as a default condition, but we also tend to actually imagine absolute conditions and absolute solutions, whether we look at our studios, we look at housing, the way it's dealt with in most conditions. So I mean, I think I'm interested in this sort of, you can call it another binary that you need to somehow blur between the absolute and the transitionary. And I think it plays out in different forms in planning, in urban design, in landscape, in preservation. Yeah. Thank you so much for this talk, and I'm in awe of you. And anybody who studied architecture in India, I'm pretty sure will be your superstar. And so my question was regarding the prototypes and the competitions that you were participating in. Um, back in my undergrad, I the had- The toilet you're talking Yes, um, so we had designed a prototype for housing in the slums of Bandra, which also was not a success. We, wanted, we didn't want to re displace the people from the slums, but design something for them within it, a better community living, because we think people don't want to move out of them because they're just very deep rooted in the culture they have within the slums. But is there any reason other than the social fabric that you feel that these prototypes are not a success or people don't want to experiment with them much? Because I feel there is no solution to the problems of the slums until and unless we experiment with them. But I don't see experimentation happening in India, especially in slums. What is your view on how, what's the way forward? Well, it's connected a bit to the last question, what you're saying. And uh, so, you know, Everyone and his uncle are in Dharavi, for example. I think every university has done a studio in Dharavi. And I don't think the solutions to Dharavi lie in Dharavi. So what we do is fetishize it, pre represent it, re-represent it. And they, the solutions to Dharavi lie in looking at the metropolitan area of Mumbai. I mean, I'm, I'm taking it to one extreme. And that's why what Charles Correa and his colleagues did with New Bombay, for me, was the last speculated avant-garde planning move that occurred in India. Since then, we have been involved with what I describe as involution, which Clifford Gertz, the social anthropologist, talked about. He talked about agricultural involution, where Indonesian rice farmers tried to do multi-cropping and break away from the rhythms of the, what rice would have normally taken. And so that makes for a very efficient uh, mechanism. But the involution implies that uh, when the system breaks down, it takes a long time to survive because it gets internally incredibly complex. So our cities are going through an involutionary kind of process. We have stopped thinking of these kind of evolutionary moves, uh, partly to do with politics, partly to do with the lack of voice that the profession has, has. So I mean, the smart cities, for example, is a program. I mean, it's ridiculous the kinds of imagination uh, they're coming up with. Because I don't think the profession has a voice. Planning has lost that speculative edge. We don't imagine speculate about these, I think it's our business. And I think society invests in us to imagine those spatial possibilities. So I think there are many, many reasons uh, for that. Uh, and of course, we can get into specific cases which is also to do with very much a specific context that part of the problem with prototypes is that they become absolute solutions uh, in a way uh, of being replicated. And you know, the second project I showed you, the competition, the Gates Foundation, this was actually funded by the Gates Foundation for an NGO in Delhi. 
And when we won it, we were so excited. I went to India, I went to this NGO to meet them. And the guy said, very embarrassed, you know, it took a long time, we couldn't wait, so we've already appointed contractors to build a prototype we had already evolved. So the Gates competition just became a tokenism, and they went ahead. So we, you know, again, found that this prototyping and this absolute solution, this universalizing of the solution is the way our economy, our political economy, everything operates uh, now. It's what Sunil Kilnani calls that today the state is involved in a statistical architecture. It's not an architecture of buildings and place making, but it's a st statistical architecture of GDP, two million toilets built. Uh, that's what the imagination of the state and the neoliberal kind of regime has come down to. And it displaces architecture and our voice, which is where we lose our agency if we don't speak up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.